Hello, my friends. Welcome to the Wise Idea Podcast with Christopher J. Harris. I am your host, Christopher J. Harris, and I'm so honored and excited that you take the time each week to join in with us. Man, it has been and it is an amazing opportunity and journey and uh, community building uh, to be able to connect with you each week. And I'm, I'm honored. I'm literally honored that you would subscribe to the Wise Idea podcast or find us on our website or connect with us on social media, whatever it may be. And so many of you all are also helping us to spread the love and you're telling other people about the Wise Idea podcast. And uh, I just want to take a moment and I want to say thank you for that. Of course, as you know, each single week, we are headlong focused on our mission to provide strategies for hearts to be inspired and heads to become wise. For those of you that may be new to our podcast, we focus on four ideas on life, leadership, family and marriage, and ministry that is the church. And so that's that's what we focus on. That's that's what our passion is. That's what our topics are, are around. And, uh, you know, I, I say it every week and uh, I'm going to keep saying it because I believe it. And I hope that you will come to believe it, that when wisdom becomes a part of your life, your entire life gets better in every single area. Well, all of this month, we've been focusing on uh, how social media has changed our lives. All of us are directly impacted. Every single individual, every parent, every business leader, uh, every ministry leader, every staff member, every coworker, at every level, every dimension, every industry, every phase and sector of society, we all have been and are impacted by social media. Well, I've got my my good friend Jason Caston. Uh, on with us again today. He started the conversation last week and it was just so much that we we had to cut it in half and uh, bring him back for part two of the conversation of how social media has changed our lives. So tune in. Let's hear more from my friend, Jason Caston. Yeah. So, so all jokes aside though. So let me, mm-hmm. let me, let me first say, let me first say that I am in love with the local church. I believe in it. I'm passionate about it. I serve it every day. Uh, I've sacrificed for it and will continue to do so. I believe in the local church. Um, I also believe that who better than those that are on the inside of an institution um, than anybody else that can offer a healthy dialogue, critique, solutions, um, recommendations for how to improve it. Uh, I am, as a pastor, blown away by the number of churches still today who have not embraced technology or social media. Um, yeah. I, I still get invited to churches who have no screens, no interest in having screens. Um, I went to go preach at a church uh, probably within the last year. I can't remember what month it was now, but I I, I went in, you know, and you know, when I go to speak at a church, I don't I don't go just to take. Uh, I'm also coming to try to be a blessing to that church, not just with my speaking and preaching or whatever they're bringing me in to do, but also in terms of giving. So, I, you know, I, I'll give an offering. Well, man, I, I literally could not give an offering because they only you can only either write a check or use cash. There was no there was no app. There was no text to give. There was no credit card. They didn't have a credit card machine in the church. They didn't have a swipe, no PayPal, no cash, no nothing. Right. And wow. so I, so after service, I told the pastor, I said, man, do you realize how many opportunities for giving and resources that you are missing? So let's 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 open up this big can of worms. What <laughs> what are you seeing right now in terms of the church and where the church may be missing it in terms of technology? Um, OK, so let me start with glass half full. I started speaking about the, the digital topics in the church in 20. 11, I think is when I started writing books and talking about it, 2011, 2012. And so in the last five, six years, I've seen progress. I can say that I've seen churches start to embrace, at least understand the need for it. Because back then they had no idea what it was and what was coming. Real real quick, uh, were any of those pastors uh, saying you're you're trying to bring the devil in the church or something like that? um, Not so much as the devil. The Internet wasn't the devil uh, just yet for the the larger churches. It was the devil for the smaller churches. Absolutely. Um, 
it was a, uh, but what I was hearing was, um, you know, you're trying to um, replace the traditional church experience, you know, and I would say, okay, I'm not trying to supplant the traditional church experience. I'm trying to supplement it um, with, you know, these online church or online digital solutions that can help make the um, church experience even better. So what, I, uh, but I, again, I've seen some great advancements and I've seen some churches actually start to embrace it. They're looking for solutions um, that are cost effective, um, you know, uh, personnel effective and stuff that'll connect with their audience. Cause you know, they have their, they, they're used to the traditional church experience, but they realize that their church is, is not growing. It's just existing. And they're wondering how this, these digital things, this social media, cause that's the sexy buzzword how this social media can help us and how the Facebook works. So that's what, that's the, the stuff that the I'm saying. Facebook, how the Facebook works. How the Facebook works and the interwebs. Absolutely. So that's the thing. So, and I mean, I'm talking about when we first got started, you know, some of the churches, the largest churches that I worked with, um, the pastors were not on board with social media. They didn't get on board with social media until they saw well, we would go, and I'm, it's interesting that you brought that example of your friend who got fired over the Instagram page. When we were at the Potter's house, we just went and made Facebook and Twitter. We just went and made it uh, because the leadership wasn't on board with social media. And so when it started to grow and it got to, you know, hundreds of thousands of followers, then they got on board. And then, you know, they started growing. Now it's one of the most effective uh, tools of the ministry, but that wasn't the case in the beginning. So, you know, that's the thing I like. And that's what led me to start writing books. And, and teaching and speaking and stuff, because um, I would come and tell these churches, no matter your size, I'm coming from a church that you guys look at that is, seems to be something that you think is very successful from a pastor who's been doing it for years. And I'm telling you, the solutions I'm bringing to you are, do not cost hundreds of thousands of dollars like it looks like on TV. Just because he's on TV doesn't mean we're spending hundreds of dollars on social media or digital stuff. I'm telling you this stuff can be done for low cost to free. We might be spending a hundred dollars a month on this stuff. They just have the people like the personnel like a Jason Casting or the team that I was with to be able to implement this stuff because I'm looking for solutions that are cost effective. And so, and I just put that all into a book and, um, and, and wrote the iChurch method for that. But that's the type of stuff that I'm seeing that churches are understanding it. They're still behind the curve. They're still at least two to three years behind what's out right now. And, uh, and even with the stuff that's coming down the line, um, I don't think they'll catch up, but they at least are not as far as behind as they were. You said you don't think that they will catch up? I don't think the church will catch up to be uh, as cutting edge as um, corporations or um, uh, secular world. No. All right. Let's dream. Of, let's dream for a moment then. Let's, let's, we're going to come right back to this conversation, but let's dream just for a moment. Let's go down another angle. So Jason Caston says, I don't think that the church will catch up. Let's dream for a moment. If the church was going to catch up, what does it need to do? If the church was going to catch up, they would need to invest in digital tech, in digital solutions. And by that, I mean, look at uh, the online digital mission field, the way they look at offline ministries that they tangible offline ministries that they can see. And if then if they started to do that, that would it would become a line item the way um, offline ministries become a lot like the men's ministry or the, the missions program, stuff like that. It would be a line item like that. Um, Additionally, they would need to measure the results of what's going on in the online space the way they measure the results of what happened in the offline space. They know how many people attend or in the sanctuary. They know how many kids are in children's church. They know how many people came to the men's meeting. They need to measure the digital space like that. So the last thing they need to do is they need to either hire people they trust or find people they trust that can educate them and inform them about what's going on in the, in the online space the, and educate themselves the way they know traditional ministry. Because when you have a pastor who starts a church, he understands traditional ministry. He's from a theological perspective, he's educated. The way to run church, he's educated. He understands that. But when it comes to that digital space, that's where the disconnect comes in. And it's like, you can be just as effective online as you are offline, but you only understand offline. They'll say all stuff like, I'm not technical. You don't have to be technical. You just have to be, if you're not smart enough to understand what's going on in the online space, you have to be smart enough to have somebody working for you that does. Man, that's incredible. So let's, let's, let's address the elephant in the room uh, because there is a lot of people who say, you know, according to Hebrews 10, for Satan, not the assembling of yourselves together. So mm -hmm. 
that that has been for many people clearly defined as you need to have your hips in the seat in the building. Um, mm -hmm. There's obviously a lot of churches and some of those you've had your hand in helping to build those platforms that have huge online membership where there is tithes and offerings coming from online. There's online members, um, online discipleship groups, small groups, online Bible studies, um, downloadable content, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So let's, let's address the elephant in the room and, and I want you to be, so you're an innovator. So I don't want you to just to answer this from an innovator techie nerdy space, right? Cause I'm, I, I'm a nerd. So I say that, you know, uh, in the truest sense, um, yeah. Let's let's deal with that tension. What? Why is the tension there? Is it is it legitimate tension? And how do how do you how do you sit down and tell a church you got to start embracing this digital mission field when theologically it's it's presupposed that you got to be sitting in the building in order to have true interaction with people. Um, if we take that route, then I start to look at uh, you know when you talk about the gathering of believers, um, what we have to look at what does that mean a gathering what does that mean to different people now traditionally gathering of believers has been we need to gather in a building because that is um, traditionally how church was held so when we look at it from other aspects of um theological perspectives and we look at great commission talking about taking the 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 gospel to you know all around the world we we look at what are the most effective ways to get the message all around the world as fast as possible. And that's when you start to look at these, um, these digital uh, solutions that we have, internet, mobile, social media, et cetera. Now, when we look at gathering and we look at things that can happen in the digital space, then can, you, um, can people gather in the digital space? Well, that starts to come down to interpretation. So depending on um, what, how comfortable you are with gathering people in the, in, in the online space, some people say, yes, I can gather with people in the online space. If I'm connected with you in an online space and we're talking, we're connecting, we're communicating effectively, then that to me is gathering. If, if um, a pastor teaches a uh, virtual church and the message goes forth and I get saved um, and I'm, you know, in a country in the Middle East where it's not safe to go to a church, it's not safe to gather traditionally, but my pastor's in the States and he's ministering to me online and I was able to get saved that way. Am I not saved because I wasn't right there with him? So then you have to look at stuff like, like that to where, you know, and, 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 uh, and how that affects people who um, can't go to the building, like the stuff we take for granted here. And mm -hmm. I don't, I, and so again, from a theological perspective, I don't, I don't really argue, try and argue theologically. I'm just looking at actually real world examples you know, of if I can't go to church, if it's not safe for me to go to church or I could get killed for going to church and I decide I want to go online because for me, staying around is better for my family and I want to go online and I want to get the same word that you got. I just don't want to go to the building. Does that mean I'm less of a Christian or does that mean the word that I got online because I received it there is less effective? So that's how you kind of look at that. Um, you know, from I understand the perspective from Hebrews. I understand also from the perspective of the Great Commission of taking the message to the masses all around the world. And so it's I do I the thing I don't like when it comes to theological differences is um, to me, it's like the kids suffer when the adults argue. And so if we're arguing about theological stuff, um, are the kids getting fed and are the kids getting the word that they need as the adults argue about semantics? Um, from a theological perspective. And in, in this case, when you say the kids and the adults arguing, you're saying that the, the in this case, the, the church is the uh, are the adults and the kids are those that we're called to serve that are not yet a part of the church. Exactly. The people we need to meet, uh, the people that we need to reach and, and bring the message to. Wow. Man, this, this is some heavy stuff. Um, and I, I just think there's a fine line, you know, that the church... Each church is going to have to wrestle with these realities. They're going to have to sit around a table with their teams and their staff and, and be stretched. Uh, I still know personally, I still know pastors who refuse to stream like, man, doc, I'm not streaming because then they won't come to church, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and things like that. Or um, I know folks who um, will, you know, record their services 
um, you know, go through the process of having all the tech stuff in the church, won't stream live, and then we'll put it on later because, again, they want people to, you know, uh, not have that advantage of, of, of seeing it live or, or whatever. Um, yeah. And I've even heard, you know, many leaders in, in many multi-ethnic and multicultural spaces who legitimately theologically argue that, you know, that scripture literally means you got to physically be in the building. Um, mm-hmm. And, and it's just so there's a tension there that, that I think that the, that many in the church, the body of Christ, church leaders and churches have to wrestle with, have to deal with. Uh, but one of the things that I'd love to talk about, this is maybe a little curveball for you uh, really fast, and that is that you know, there's an issue that we still have to address, even when we talk about all of this technology, that there is a digital divide and that there is a gap in technology and access to technology. So what mm-hmm. would you recommend to leaders and to churches, leaders, whether they're in faith community or not, you know, business community, nonprofit, what have you, um, what would you talk to them about in terms of this, the, the gap, the digital divide um, and, and all of that? Um, I would say when we're looking at the digital divide, um, you know, especially if we base it on communities of color or um, uh, we look at it from an economic perspective, um, you know, uh, those who have less than communities that have more. Uh, I think that one of the things we're seeing as far as um, utilizing the technology from a economic level or, or, or community of color is that the engagement is still there as far as utilizing the technology. And I mean like social media and digital stuff. The difference is when it comes to who's creating the technology and who taking the STEM classes and who's uh, actually walking down these paths to um, uh, becoming the people who innovate in these particular areas. And I, and I, I think that that aspect has to be, it, we have to reframe how the technology is presented. So leaders can present technology to the kids in different ways. Here's an example. If we decide to bring, um, you know, uh, the video game Fortnite. The video game Fortnite is one of the most popular games, just like Minecraft was among young young kids as well as older, old, older people play Fortnite as well. I think they play Minecraft too. Yeah, they had to because it was bought by Microsoft for a billion. So there goes that. But when my, Minecraft and Fortnite were presented to my kids, um, it was presented as here's something that all the kids are playing. What my kids um, and the way it was never presented to them, what they never understood, and even when I was younger, as far as playing video games, it was never presented to me that you could create your own game, you could create your own app, you can create this and that. The stuff that you're playing, you can create something like that. Now, you have to make sure that you understand when you're presenting it to them. You can't say you can create all of Fortnite because that is a huge game. But you have to give them pieces that they can create and help them understand that if you learn how to write code or you learn how to do this and that, you could create the stuff that you consume. If we reframe the message, and that's, pre- again, this all comes down to really you could do it with great marketing. If you reframe the message, um, you know, then you can really help them understand that they can create just as much as they consume. But if they're only taught to consume, then the divide continues to remain. Because when you look at actual stats, the use of social media, regardless of economic status and uh, communities of color, is very is the same. But when it comes to you know uh, Silicon Valley and who's working out there and who's creating these startups and who has access to the capital, that's where you start to see divides and division. And who goes into STEM fields, you start to see those divisions. And that because and to me, it's because you know um, outside of small groups of creators and tech people like myself who create startups, we don't we're not taught to create as much as we are to consume. Hmm. Man, this is this is uh, <laughs> this is so good and so much that we have learned today and been stretched with and talked through and talked about. Um, you know, I think for for me as a leader, I think it's just important for all of our folks that are listening to this leaders in various spaces to simply at, at least though pause sometimes to acknowledge that some of the people that you're trying to reach or you, that you're planning for or programming for or uh, trying to connect with that that don't make the assumption that everybody has the smartphone and that everybody has the Wi-Fi and that everybody has the high speed internet and that everybody has the smart TV and da, 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 da. And that there may be some adjustments that you have to even make in your leadership and what you offer to make sure that you're reaching people because everybody may not be as forthright to say, Hey, I can't afford internet at my house. Right. Or, or whatever that may look mm-hmm. like. So I think there's a, uh, mm-hmm. there's, there's all of that reality. So let's, 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 let's go ahead and, and shift 
tracks for just a second, Jason. We, we are, man, we've been on here for a minute. This has been an incredible conversation. Um, so I got, I got some speed, quick fire questions for you. And uh, <laughs> okay, yeah, it's gonna be fun. So the goal is, is for you to answer the question, you know, as honestly, quickly uh, as you can. So that's that's the goal. Okay. All right, you ready? You need to drink a water first, or you good? No, nah, I mean we got to just jump right into this. <laughs> okay. All right. First question: Apple or PC? Apple all day. Okay. All right. Uh, what's your What are your favorite top five apps that you use on a regular basis? Um, Instagram, Facebook, uh, Gmail, um, Weather, and um, iMessage. Wow. So, so you, this is not a quick fire question. So are you, do you get aggravated when you have to communicate with people that are not on iPhones? I mean, you talk about the green bubble. Oh my God. If it comes up green, I'm like, you know, you must be dead to me. Oh my goodness. What is really going on? Why did you make that life decision? Don't get me wrong. I have an Android as well because I need to develop for both apps. But again, once I see that green bubble, I'm like, oh, this is what we're doing today. Oh man. <laughs> All the Android users that are listening to this is like, okay, this guy's a hater. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know that's right. That's yeah. why I had to preface it with saying I have an Android as well to say, hey, I'm team you guys, but I'm not. No, no. You it. guys made that wrong life decision. <laughs> that's hilarious. All right, back to the quick fire. If you could do yeah. any other career, what would you do? Hmm, besides uh that, um, wow. Oh man, I can't even think of that. Never been asked that before. Um, I probably would want to be a, a motivational speaker. Okay. All right. I have a theory about motivational speakers. Uh, I think that many motivational speakers are actually called to preach, but ex are afraid to acknowledge the call. I could totally agree with that. Yeah, that's my, that's my total editorial, though. So I have nothing to prove that. That's just my editorial. Oh, yeah. I, I, I totally agree with you with nothing to back it up. Just a <laughs> sure agreement. <laughs> I love that, man. That's true brotherhood right there. Look, bro, <laughs> we, we, we don't have any research on that, but I agree with you. <laughs> exactly. All right. Favorite food? Uh, oh, right now? Oh, steak. Filet mignon. Favorite movie? Oh, The Wiz. Michael Jackson. Favorite TV show? Uh, right now, favorite TV show. What do I watch all the time? Um, Silicon Valley, HBO. Last three books that you've read. Um, oh, wow. Oh, man. Let me look. Uh, let's see. Oh, goodness. I can't even find them. I'm trying to think. The Power of One, um, 48 Laws of Power, and uh, the Amazon story, Jeff Bezos' Amazon story. Okay. Um, what was your favorite subject in school? Uh, math. When you're alone in the car, what do you think about? Hmm. Oh, man. Uh, I think about um, now in the future. Who has who is the person that's had the most impact in your life? Mm, my mom. Did you win any superlatives in high school? Win any superlatives? You got to clarify that for me. Like, you know, like best dressed or, you know, most athletic or anything like that. Oh, um. Uh, no, no, no. Ah, uh, I didn't win any of those. Nope. Okay. What are you not good at? Oh, wow. Man, I'm pretty sure my wife should answer this one. Uh, <laughs> All wives can answer this question. Man, um, I'm not good at cleaning up. Terrible at it. Really? Yeah, yeah, awful. Okay. All right, last question. Last question. What is something that is unique about you that will surprise people to learn about you? Huh, something unique. Um, let's see. Uh, I, I think for me personally, I think it's that I sit at home um, a lot. Like people think, um, you know, I'm always on the go or always doing stuff. I'm at home a lot. Like really just, I mean, I, I'm doing stuff, working and stuff but I spend a lot of time at home. I'm always trying to be a homebody. 
That is incredible. That is absolutely amazing. And so, Jason Caston, thank you so much, my friend, for being on today and spending the time to hang out with us and to talk with us and to stretch us a little bit in terms of technology. You talk to us as individuals. You talk to us as parents and family and leaders. You talk to us as leaders and, and leading our organizations. And then you talk to the church today and you did it all within a short period of time, man. Thank you so much. Uh, real fast, if somebody wants to get a hold of you, how do they find you? Oh, you find me on um, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, at Jason Caston, J-A-S-O-N-C-A-S-T-O-N, um, all those different platforms. Talk to me on social media. I actually talk back. He does. I'm a living witness. And uh, <laughs> we'll have his links all in the show notes as well. Real quick, Jason, before we jump off of here, uh, tell everybody real fast about your new tech startup and uh, what's going to be coming out here in just a few months and uh, and the new book. Absolutely. So the tech startup is called Composio. It's a platform. We help authors write uh, publish and market their books all from a single platform. I have written about 10, 11 books. The self-publishing process was difficult. Also, I didn't sign to a major book publisher because I didn't want to give up the rights to my books. I wanted to own my own intellectual property. So I created a platform that was, is automating the entire publishing process. There's a lot of authors out there. Everybody wants to write a book. This will help you take go from the entire process from idea all the way to published on all the major platforms that you'd like as well as helping you write better, faster, smarter, uh, utilizing smart templates and, of course, AI. The next book I have coming out is called Digital Connections, and it is actually a book talking about a lot of stuff we got into today. It's about digital, um, digital topics, digital landscape, and what's coming in the digital space. And I always focus on five areas, websites, multimedia, e-commerce, social media, and mobile. And then I have another section called Innovation because there's so many new things that are coming and I dive into it, help you get educated and updated on what's coming. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen, the Jason Caston in live and living color in person, telling you everything that you need to know about digital tech stuff that's coming up. And so I'm so excited, Jason, that you would take the time to be on with us today and to help us out. You have heard how to find him. You've heard what he's working on. You've heard his heart and you've even heard how he responds to people when the green bubble comes up. It doesn't get any more <laughs> real than that. So thank you again for listening today to the Wise Idea Podcast. Our goal, again, is to provide tools and strategies for hearts to live inspired and for heads to live wise. I'm so excited and so happy that you have enjoyed, I believe, our time together. If you did and you would like additional resources and information, you can find the information and more at the wise idea podcast.com. I want to invite you, please also join in on the conversation on social media. On Twitter and on Facebook, we are at the wise idea. On Instagram, we are at the wise idea podcast. And uh, I'm also, guess what, on social media. Personally, you can find me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and yes, even on Pinterest, all at CJ Harris O N E. Again, I want to invite you, please head over to iTunes and Google Play and leave us a rating and a review. Of course, we're also on Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify Radio, iHeartRadio coming soon. I would love to hear from you directly. So if you got something you want to share, you also want to let me know you're listening, send me an email at info, I-N-F-O, at thewiseideapodcast.com. Thank you again for joining us. I look forward to talking with you the next time. You know how I end every single week. Live wisely.